Awesome. Give a hand for Julian Goodwin. Um, blinking LED on a triple five, not so much. I, I come from a high level world of systems, not wires. So this is the board. Um, I know it unfortunately isn't too clear on the pr presentation. You're welcome to come down and have a look at the demo hardware later. Um, it's just a basic ARM SOC board with a couple of tweaks for my purposes. And that's to be used in a GPS drive, Stratum 1 NTP server. I like playing with time. Um, some of you will have seen the cesium clock I use as a monitor stand, for example. Um, yeah, not so much on the internet things. I like my time. And I also wanted to experiment with some technologies I've always wanted to play with. Uh, Power over Ethernet is something I've used as a network administrator many times for many things, and I roughly understand it, and actually implementing it in a, in a system on the client end, I know a little better now. Uh, synchronous Ethernet, as much as as a network operator, I hate synchronous networks with a passion, there's some interesting concepts for time distribution and something I want to play with. And it's an excuse to buy more test equipment. Um, as many people will know, buying toys for your hobby is always fun, and a very easy way to completely empty your bank account. So the board I built is based off the BeagleBoard suite of boards. Um, most well known is the BeagleBone Black, this one, or photo up there, which are a series of ARM boards built around a family of Texas Instruments processors, the TI Satara line. These are by modern standards, fairly lightweight cores. They're 32-bit cores. They're simple-ish. But they've got a nice set of functionality like uh, a pair of microcontroller cores in addition to the normal ARM cores that are really great for certain use cases and a heck of a lot of GPIOs, HDMI. A lot of the features of Raspberry Pi, but a bit different. Uh, and I believe it predates Raspberry Pi. A couple of years ago, now, the Pocket Beagle came out, which is a little thing in the blister pack here. Because what happened is everything gets denser. So now we can make these even smaller. And we'll get to how in a minute. So I'm actually using this chip variant, and I'm, I based my design on the Pocket Beagle because it simplified my implementation a lot, and smaller is cheaper to assemble as well. And Part of that is on the straight Beagle board, you've got DRAM, you've got flash, you've got a lot of things that require uh, special signal routing. You need to take into account signal quite a lot more. It's not easy for a hobbyist to build. You might need to go to six layer boards. Those are hard. You might need to go to tiny traces. Those are hard. Um, actually doing time matching on wide signal traces like the DRAM is doable and better every day, just not trivial. Getting some of these parts in small quantity is hard. Um, getting data sheets is often hard. Sometimes you can buy the parts really easily, but you go to the vendor for the data sheet and go, oh, if you're not buying 10,000 of them, no, we won't give you the data sheet. There's secret, secret IP in our trivial fire chip. It happens. But now we're getting some deeper integration, and part of this is the ever, um, the ever ensuring minification work that's going on, sort of the reverse of the uh, FPGA 65 we heard about earlier today. Uh, the one that many of you will have seen, and those of you who are professionals, look in your bag for the Raspberry Pi's style of this, which is package on package, where you actually put a second BGA chip on top of a BGA chip, because that way you don't have to route the traces. You just already have them there. This is great but you still have all the other annoying things to connect that need to wire in. So if you look at the schematic for a Raspberry Pi, you'll see that the memory is fine, 
but there's still some other things that are a bit annoying that make it hard to really shrink down much. And then there's system in package. So for the Pocket Beagle line, this is a integration done by a company called Octavo Systems, and I'm using the same chip for my own project. And that takes not just the memory, but also some of the power management ICs, the sequencing ICs, uh, a control EEPROM. In one of their versions, they also integrate Flash, but I'm just using SD, and sticks it all in a single large IC package, which means that apart from uh, one particular logic gate, the entire Pocket Beagle is a single chip. You provide clock, you provide power, you provide a single five volt line, you have a Linux system, which is pretty amazing. So I have my board, what's on it? We start out with the Octavo uh, integrated TI Satara processor. We had gigabit ethernet. Um, this is one of the key reasons I made the board. None of the BeagleBone, none of the major BeagleBone variants actually have gigabit ethernet on board, even though the processor supports it. And for a couple of the weird features, you need it to be a gigabit ethernet. I also, because it was convenient, added the uh, headers for power over ethernet, take the center taps out of the magjack. Um, although we'll, We'll get to another bit about that later. Um, just power inputs and monitor the other voltage rails. Some LEDs. Really helpful to know, is that doing nothing because it's just really slow reading off the flash? Is it doing nothing because it crashed? Is it doing nothing because I didn't wire things up correctly? LEDs indications of what of status are really helpful. You have the micro SD card, just really easy way to get data in these days. A couple of UARTs, just one for console, one for uh, application purposes. This is another reason why the bit, I prefer the TI processor over the one in the uh, Raspberry Pi, which only has a single UART just as a console debug. It doesn't have extra ports if you have things that need to connect via standard serial couple of spare GPIO, GPIO lines. Um, there's many, many, many more in the chip that I'm not using at all, but I wired a couple out just in case, and I did indeed use one. And USB. So the design process is basically find parts that look like they do what I need. I mean, Google search for gigabit ethernet Phi chip, you'll find 20 or 30, and add in the, ex the appropriate things, look at a data sheet, look, look if it does what someone, what I need, um, confirm I can actually buy them, go on DigiKey, go, yes, it's available in cut tape, looks like they actually stock them, and then later on, make sure they'll actually talk to each other. Um, one of the ways I'd often do this is, like, let's just do a search for the uh, Phi part number I'm using and the TI Satara core I'm using, Oh, look, there have been a couple of people who've had problems with this design, but they got through it and it worked. So that's a good sign that it'll work for me if I don't screw it up. And I also split out the modules on the test board. So my whole system is more than just that little SOC, so I can prototype the different sections together. Uh, separately, sorry, not together. Um, there's a GPS board that's Largely just a breakout for a U-Blox, particular variant of a U-Blox module. Um, you can see my wonderful hand soldering skills there. And on the right is a power over ethernet uh, test board. I in fact ordered this the day before, or ordered it sent to my manufacturer the day before the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus was announced. So between when I ordered it and when it arrived, I'd actually gotten a 3B Plus and did a test power over ethernet boot. So outside of the people at Raspberry Pi working on their hats, I was probably one of the first people to do that. Uh, we'll talk later. <laughs> May not have caught fire, it did other fun things. Um, it might have caught fire had I left it alone. Uh, all my design and layout was done in KiCad, 
one of the boards, I think, was still version 4, but most of them and all the SOC board was KiCad 5, uh, various RC versions, and now I'm doing edits in KiCad 5 release. And there was a Pocket Beagle KiCad design released, which I'm not sure if it's actually the, the same source as the Pocket Beagle uh, used for production, but I used that as a starting point for my schematic. Um, that's an eye chart. You don't need to read it. Uh, I never have the whole screen visible when I'm doing design work. It's a zoom in thing. This is what the schematic ended up being. Um, it's not particularly well grouped. Um, I could clean it up, make it beautiful. Those of you that watch Dave Jones on EEV blog will have seen rants about beautiful schematic design. I, I try to make it clear enough for me and I'm not sure. These design files will be up on a blog when my brain recovers. Um, it's been a busy couple of days. So you can have a look later if you want. All the slides will be up as well. Uh, that's what the board looks like in KiCad, just in the PCB editor. Um, this is particularly fun because that's about real zooms levels I work with, just I'm normally having my eyes about here. Um, so you do things like look at those tiny little resistors that are around this package and go, oh yeah, those are huge. Those will be nice and easy to hand solder if I need to work on anything. They're not. Um, the tiny little pads on the ethernet fire, which is a thing with 49 ground there, you can hand solder them. It's possible, I've done it. I probably wouldn't take a bet on if I could successfully do it arbitrarily. It, it is hard to deal with microelectronics these days as a hobbyist. Um, it's not easy for people who do it full-time professionally. They've got their tool set, they've got some nice soldering toys, it's just hard to deal with things this small. Uh, one thing KiCad has is a surprisingly decent 3D rendering, as Zob's mentioned in his talk. You can get 3D, uh, 3D packages, um, sorry, 3D files of the various packages that you're using. So, for example, Molex have a 3D file for the Ethernet jack I'm using, which is great because I had to make my own PCB footprint for it. And I can look at it in the rendering and go, well, the two mesh. I mean, they, I might have stuffed it up in the same way they stuffed it up, but that seems a bit unlikely. So I've got some confidence it'll work when I actually order boards. Uh, Hirose, or Hiros, don't know how they pronounce that, uh, do a very garish rendering of their SD card socket, which is helpful to confirm that, yes, I can have it nominally go a little bit off the board because that's just where the card lives, not actually the connector. Um, versus some of my other parts don't. Most of the library parts have 3D, standard 3D packages in the full KiCad library set. So if you're doing a design, you would just go view 3D and it will all be there. But not all. Uh, the crystals, for example, don't. Uh, this is the ray tracer renderer, not the standard OpenGL. When you're just working on a board design, you just use the OpenGL renderer because it's nice and interactive, even with Intel graphics on a laptop. The ray trace renderer takes about 30 seconds on my laptop to render that image. Um, but it does look a bit nicer. Manufacturing. So this is too complex for me to hand solder, by far. There are people out there um, in Australia, New Zealand, I know of a couple that can hand solder boards like this. Not entirely sure how they manage it. It's, it's not hugely difficult, it's just you need to be precise and accurate and probably have more space than my kitchen cooktop, which is where I tend to do my assembly. So you go out to a manufacturer. Luckily, we live in the future and there is this wonderful thing of contract manufacturers where you can upload your design files, they take your money and a month later you have boards in your hand. Uh, I use the guys on the right. They're in New York. Um, there are many, many options. The crowd supply provider directory has a pretty decent list of options. 
check the restrictions. Every CM I've looked at for various things all have restrictions that if you know them at the very start of a project, they're trivial and won't bother you whatsoever. If you discover them when you go to deliver your files and go, oh, you need to get two, three mil traces through that, between that BGA and that's not possible in four mil, oh, and the minimum size is four mil, or the price doubles if you go to three mil. Things like that happen. Um, so if you are designing a board that you think will get manufactured, you need to know who you're going to get manufactured by, or be a simple enough board that you can be fairly safe with any manufacturer. Um, and you can look at most of the big ones and go, oh, everything's really cheap if I use these options. Go to two or three of the manufacturers that have those details and you can go, all right, if I just restrict myself to this, it should be pretty easy. And if you're just getting boards done and not extra stuff, you essentially give them the PCB data in Gerber files, as they're called, uh, including the various paste and drill files as well. You then give them a place file, which says part num there is a part reference one that is in this X and Y position with this rotation. Um, and then you give them parts details, which might be combined with one of the other files, might not. And that says that's a 0603 resistor made by Samsung, it's this model number, for example. This is where you get people building their own systems. Um, I think everyone here at this conference that I've talked to that makes hardware has their own version of this process where they can take data out of their electronic EDA, or their EDA system, run it through something that is really, really terrible because they wrote it for themselves at wanting to solve their immediate problem and every time they run into a bug, well, I fix that. But they don't really try to make it work reliably. It just has to work for them. Um, in my case, it's the schematic comes out of eSchema, is exported through a plugin to give me a CSV file because when I originally did it, it was a really trivial script. These days, I might just take the XML but someone also said there's a less terrible interface now as well. Um, from the board, I take the position file export from PCB new. I run it through a hacky Python script which contains some indirection and mapping. Um, this is really useful because a lot of the parts on this board are pretty simple resistors or small capacitors. The half-life of an 0603 ceramic capacitor on DigiKey it's about 30 minutes between when they're available and when they disappear, because everyone's been ordered. This is a bit of a pain and means while I'm going through the process of just getting my quote from the manufacturer, if I need to update a new rev, my, my capacitor might be out of stock already. So I don't want to have to go through and edit the 30 capacitors on the board, let alone just finding them to change the part value. So I have that indirection layer in the middle which is really helpful. It also means that if I go to a manufacturer that has, for example, house parts, which is pretty standard, where it's like for the top 20 common values of capacitor and resistor, they just have a reel of it, and it's half the price if you use their reel. Well, I just change a couple of values and it's done. The cost for a board run ends up being about $1,000 for the board assembly and delivery to Australia. Um, the delivery is a trivial sub part of that because it's essentially just USPS flat rate in a box, which unfortunately adds about a week because USPS getting out of New York these days is not quick. The MagJack and micro SD card for all the boards adds about 120 bucks. Um, a power over ethernet supporting gigabit Ethernet connector with the magnetics on board, the transformers, is about $15 Australian from DigiKey. They're not cheap. So, assuming my time's free, it's about $190 a board in quantity six. Price would go down a bit if I ordered more. Um, I'd probably need to order 30 or 40 for it to start getting maybe down to 130, 140 a board. But the reality is I'm not going to get it cheap. 
And in small quantities, these dead boards are cheaper than the chips on them. Um, the Pocket Beagle is almost exactly the same price retail as the chip is individually from DigiKey, which means you're not going to compete with these dev boards. That's something of a change from a couple of years ago where dev boards would be unreasonably expensive, um, in part to incent you not to just install the dev board as part of your product. Um, Raspberry Pi and Arduino have essentially triggered a bit of a change in market in that area. And assembly, automated assembly is expensive. If you can amortize the set setup cost, which is the goal with automated assembly, it starts getting pretty cheap. But when you're building six, the reason they're charging you so much is because they're setting up a pick and place machine for six boards. And if you've got 20 or 30 different line items, they've got to get 20 or 30 different parts all ready for you. But you put an order in a month later, you get a box in the mail and it's got static bags and it's got things you designed in it, which is really cool. Then comes the next big fun. So bring up, bring up, uh, if you talk to some of the people here that work on power, I know some of the regular power folk that come here have been involved with board bring up, going back to power five even we might have, some of them might have done that. Um, or if you went to Stuart Smith's firmware talk, you just talked about having to do all this stuff before DRAM is running and all the fun that that exposed. Now, luckily, if you're just building on someone else's chips, this is pretty easy, but you still need to be able to test and debug before the CPU core is running. And it's unlikely that everything's gonna work. You probably won't get every single board working. Might get lucky, might not. Um, some of that is just mere assembly tolerances and soldering. You might have things tweaked wrong. You might actually want to disassemble or part disassemble a board so you can test a subcomponent on it. You might, um, I just have this little board that I did the other day where I now need to assemble the front half of the board and the back half of the board on some test boards to see which side I screwed up because I can tell I screwed it up and I can tell that chip's not working, but I'm not sure if that chip's not working because of this chip or something else. It's a bit annoying. So you absolutely build more than you need. If you build one board, you have the one magic board that takes five volts and then you plug six volts into it because you're using a power supply with terrible user interface and you blow it up and then you start crying. And yes, I did this and I later found out the board luckily hadn't died, but it sure looked like it at the time. Uh, if you're actually going to do production runs, you need automated testing. Um, Zobs, who's here this week, gave a talk earlier today, has a project called Xclave, which is essentially a framework for building automated testing rigs um, on the software side. And that's a link to, uh, Bunny did a post about it just a couple of weeks ago. It's absolutely something to look at if you're doing big. So this is a photo of the first, very first power up of my board. Um, there's no SD in it, it was never gonna work. But the power light came on. And the power light is actually on the low, on the user side, on the core side of the power regulators. So this, this indicated that I hadn't actually gotten the chip the wrong way around. And you might think that's a silly thing to not be sure about, but that was actually one of the things where I literally woke up at 3 a.m. one day and went, I think I sent this to assembly with the chip 180 degrees around the wrong way. Luckily I hadn't, and I, I went to my assembler, went, it looks like I didn't screw it up, but I'm not entirely certain. And it arrives, and it's like, I'm still not entirely certain. Power it up, LED, good. Um, this was also where I hit my first weird issue. This is actually at work on, um, one of my lab power supplies that I have at work because it wouldn't work on the lab power supply ahead of time. For whatever reason, and this is a basic DC power supply, just will not power this board. I don't know why. And it's annoying because my other lab power supply at home blew up, so I went and bought a replacement, but yeah. And 
there's the feeling you get, um, for those of you that have ever assembled a PC from just go to MSY, buy a pile of components, check it in, watch it boot, it's like, yay, it booted. When it's something you've designed, that feeling is the full on, woo. Something I designed has a Linux kernel running on it when you get to that stage. So the next couple of stages were all just various things in U-boot, the um, common embedded bootloader. Uh, started out with an image that's known to fail. This might seem odd, but if I get a known error message at a, at a certain point, that means I know the stuff before that error message is working. So I know the power supplies work, I know the core works, I know the micro SD works, at least sort of. Um, I know the console works, at least sort of, which is great because it means I can move on to the next stuff. Um, the next image is one to program the onboard EEPROM. Um, this is where I discovered one of my board bugs because it turns out I'd stuffed up the right protect pin. Luckily in a way that was repairable um, because normally that would be an embedded header and I would have had to done really annoying things to work around. Um, this image also then, when the EEPROM is programmed, reboots and tells U-boot, yeah, you're totally a beagle bone black. The cores are configured similarly enough that this actually works and boots and this is how I got the first Linux boot on my system, which as I said, it's one of those, this succeeded, I built Linux system, yay, moments. Uh, and then third, I was able to, to run unmodified upstream BeagleBone images that just went, I have a, I'm a BeagleBone pocket. I am a BeagleBone pocket, it's, or pocket Beagle, it's just normal. But I added Ethernet, so I need to configure that. Now, for systems that lack like PCI or embedded in general these days, we have a nice standard way to do it called device tree. And the really nice thing about device tree is it's not something you compile for the exact kernel running on it, it's you take a file, you run device tree compiler, you drop that file, however your bootloader injects it into kernel, and you have configured a kernel that you didn't have to compile. So to add the on, to make the onboard ethernet work it was about 100 lines of device tree config and that should have made ethernet work. Yeah. So the last time I compiled a kernel was a long time ago. And it was a backport of a backport and I was able to use distro tooling. And I'm very happy I haven't had to do that. So my Ethernet interface appeared when I used the device tree. And the file would show up. Well, sometimes the file would show up. And that, that's a bit weird and I've still never figured that part of it out. Link would come up, I'd plug in Ethernet. And it's like, yay, you have Ethernet link, it's gigabit or 100 meg and seemed to work fine. But no packets went through. No errors counters went up either, which is really weird. Because I pull my scope out and I actually see data going across the, the bus between the Ethernet file and the core. And it's like, how do I get data going across a bus and no counters going up? Now, on the one side, I've got the TI chip, which is a little bit complex and okay, I, I might have screwed it up. Unfortunately, on the other side, I have a piece of enterprise networking hardware that I very much trust to get the counters correct, at least at that level. And it's telling me there's also zero. So it's like, no. And when I got the, have you tried using Wireshark suggestion to debug it? It's like, no, it's not helpful. So while I was debugging the why isn't the fire appearing, I was tracing the control signals that the FI has, which is a separate, uh, so the so-called MDIO bus, and put in a scope trace, exported it from my scope, because unfortunately, despite buying a very, very nice brand new oscilloscope this year, it doesn't support the protocol debug of this particular type of serial bus. But what does is the open source SIGROC stack with the PulseView GUI. So export scope traces, run through dodgy Python script that just goes and implements a comparator in Python, also known as if less than, um, write it all down to a, a quick file, import into PulseView, go, you have MDIO bus on here. It's like, oh, I can see that it's reading the bus fine, there are zero errors, and this all looks pretty good. And eventually I just went, I assume there's a kernel bug here, and switched to a newer kernel, and the 
detection problems went away. So still don't know. Um, but my ethernet wasn't working. So this is my desk at home, um, actually fairly clean. To give you an idea, I'm not, I'm not full on analog engineer, but I'm getting there. Um, and I'm just, I've got my scope attached to all the four power rails the ethernet chip uses, because it takes four power rails, unfortunately. And I'm, one of the power rails in particular, I'm probably overloading. I, I'm actually pulling more than the spec says I should. So I run a scope trace on it and it's like, no, nope, all the rails are rock solid stable. Huh. There's a little bit tighter shot and you can see, um, you might be able to see there's, there is one blue wire there that is actually attached to the fire chip. That was one of the two successful mod wires I attached to the chip. I uh, only took about 20 attempts each time. Um, luckily for the power traces, there were much easier to ac access locations. Um, but while I'm doing this, I'm also reading the data sheet a lot, trying to understand. And that's where I encountered my absolute favorite line in any data sheet ever. Now, for those of you that do networking, should has a very specific meaning, at least in network contexts, and maybe they're not using it. So when I see something along the lines of should be aligned, it's just, no, this is wrong. Either it must be aligned or it doesn't matter at all. This is not a performance thing because this is the wake on LAN configuration. And if you're worried about the performance of your wake on LAN packets, you, then Stuart Smith has clearly actually succeeded in making your power box boot in half a second somehow, more power to him. But yeah, um, if you search for that literal string, you will find the original data sheet and that is actually in there. So the bug is here. There is a real bug, it was my fault. Um, eventually after about six weeks and I was on vacation for a few months. So this was six weeks as much as I could let my brain handle, which admittedly wasn't much because vacation. But it probably took at least a week of full-time work equivalent to try and figure out what's happening here. And I eventually give up and ask the internet. And that's when I get a bunch of not particularly helpful answers. Um, and some that are just, wow, that sucks, I hope you find something. More reasonable. So the bug's here. Um, if you pulled up that data sheet to go find the hilarious quote from before, you, could, you might also have gone to the pinout section and noticed that I got those two the, around the wrong way. And that it perfectly explains the bug I was seeing because it turns out if you never tell the far side that there's data, it never bothers looking at the data lines, and so your error counters never go up. Now, you might remember I've said actually connecting wires to the little fire chip is really hard. Connecting wires underneath the BGA is impossible, so this one was not one I was fixing with anything but a board respin, which is a bit annoying. But at least I had a pretty good explanation for what went wrong. Uh, across the boards, this is, I think, the complete list of things I stuffed up. Um, so I broke USB. This is annoying because it meant I had no high-speed data on the board. The only way I could really communicate was either the console or by taking the SD card out, putting it in my laptop, mounting it, unmounting. Which is fine. It's not that annoying to do. But it does mean that once the system was live, I couldn't really do anything fast. Um, I suppose I could have connected a modem to the other UART port, run PPP, and done all that. I'm not that much of a retro lover, and it probably would have been faster to just do most of my file transfers by shutting down and replugging. Um, the USB was actually something I prototyped. I, in fact, still have the Procket Beagle I was prototyping on um, sitting in front of my TV, blinking really brightly at me um, with a USB Ethernet adapter in it. And I prototyped it, I tested it, it worked perfectly. And then I just didn't actually do what I'd prototyped when I wrote the schematic up. Um, there's a drive VBUS line, which is a control voltage output to switch a MOSFET. And I connected that to VBUS. And what I didn't do was connect to a five volt source at all. Um, that's easy enough to just bypass and 
cut the trace and put voltage on, except the chip is too smart for that. It will go, oh, but you're not actually in USB host mode because I know VBUS isn't driven. So no USB. Um, so the Ethernet, I mentioned I stuffed up the TXRX. I also didn't do length matching. Um, length matching, as I mentioned, for the DRAM is something that matters. Gigabit Ethernet's only 250 megahertz. Uh, you can do some numbers on what that means with trace length. And I had everything within about five millimeters, which eh, probably would have been OK. Um, but I actually went back and did length match it all because KiCad has features for that. And if I'm going to redo the whole, that whole area of the circuit anyway, it wasn't a huge amount of work in the end. Um, so I don't actually know whether I needed to do it, but it wasn't hard. Uh, the EEPROM write protectors I mentioned, I actually split a test point into two. So the one I had labeled as write protect was a random GPIO. And one of the hard to find unlabeled test points was not. Um, on the power board, I used a wrong diode. When I was ordering, I went and went, oh, I have three different types of diode on here. Why don't I just order two? And forgot that the third was there was a specific type of diode for a specific reason. And while the, while the POE control would work up to about 100 milliwatt, if you drew anything more than that, it would just collapse. Uh, and the thermal pad and the SOIC SO SO didn't work. There's a whole how you do thermal pads with vias thing that I should probably have paid more attention to. Uh, and on the GPS, I just, once again, I used the wrong part. I used an open drain buffer, not a push-pull buffer. Luckily, their standard TTL logic, I just hot ed one off, hot ed a new one on, all was good. Uh, power usage. So nice, tiny embedded boards use very little power, or at least low power. Um, at idle, my previous power supply, which I now don't trust, not least of which because it's blown up, um, would claim this used half a watt. It kind of doesn't in practice, so I'm glad I knew that. Uh, to zoom in on, on that power supply display, at complete CPU idle with no Ethernet link, we're looking at 1.1 watts. So that is Linux running, no uh, the random background stuff that is on a Beagle board image is running, but nothing else. So system D, a couple of other things, 1.1 watts. The Ethernet controller is powered but has no link. If I just add an Ethernet link, I add another 700 milliwatts. And that is less than I was expecting. It, um, about one watt a link is a pretty standard number that gets thrown around for Ethernet. And if I max out the CPU, I get 2.7 watts. Um, whether I do zero data or a, as much data as the chip can pass through the Ethernet doesn't change power usage. So it is very much the Ethernet link that uses the power, not the data, at least with one gigabit. Uh, timeline, this ended up being a project across the whole year. Um, the airplane symbols, I did a lot of travel this year. Every one of those symbols is a week I was out of the country. Um, at least four times this year, something arrived while I was in the Sydney airport lounge on my way out of the country. And I think twice it was boards for this project. So it's really easy to lose a month accidentally, and it's a bit terrible. Um, but in the end, everything worked. Um, test equipment was mostly all really basic stuff. Power supply, multimeter, TTL serial. Yes, I bought a really expensive oscilloscope. It's really handy. Had I not stuffed up the ethernet, I wouldn't have needed it. Um, DC loads, really handy for testing power boards, and GPS, need did GPS stuff. Um, just some random tips and tricks to close off. Um, schematic stuff, label it, add more GPIs, add more LEDs, at least on dead boards, you'll use them. Um, board design, mounting holes are your friends, even if you only do, use them to run uh, modwise through. And of course, version your boards. Skillet reflow works. Uh, there, for those of you who use KiCad, there is a HTML bomb plugin. It is amazing. And for storage of micro SD cards, you can get these little credit card sized envelopes. They are big enough, even I can handwrite on them and have a mild hope I can read what they say. Um, but I can stick a micro SD card inside and they don't disappear, which is wonderful for actually being able to find things because you don't want to have one micro SD card and not be able to do that. 
So that's it. Any particular questions, or I'll be around. Later. It's uh, more uh, my workflow comment. Uh, I use KaiCost with KaiCAD to do my bombs. Uh, it does scraping of all the vendor sites, does pricing and availability. So it's actually quite handy. And I just send that file to the manufacturer. Yep. So it does a nice Excel file. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you end up some combination of what you think works for you and yeah. How complex your boards are changes what you build. So yeah, originally, yeah. I just put individual digi key part numbers on everything. That's yeah. not practical when you've got 30 of the same cap. Yeah, so uh, what KaiCos does essentially is you label one, and if you have 30 or 6 or 3, 10 microfarads, it can pull them, which makes it really easy. Yeah, cool. Another question up here. Hi. Um, where did you get your MAC address from? Ah, so the TI chips, the TI chips at the silicon level do have a pre-burned in MAC. It is not actually read from the EEPROM. So when I'm programming the EEPROM, although I'm programming in the serial number of one of my pocket beagles, that's only used to display the pocket beagle serial and it's a model beagle. The actual MAC address is burned into the silicon by TI. Right, so the, the pocket beagle comes with it, not the phi. Yes, so the beagle core comes with it, and is, I don't need to do anything to actually get unique max, and I am guaranteed 20 or something. It's actually quite a high number if you read the TI data sheets, more than you will ever need. Any more questions? As I say, you're welcome to come look at hardware now, talk to me around the conference. Cool. On behalf of uh, all of us, small token of our appreciation, Julian. Thank you. Give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.